In this video, we're going to take a look at the spring joint. Now, this is aptly named because what this is going to do is give you the ability to take a rigid body, like a sphere in this particular case, and attach a spring-like constraint to it that responds to both compression and extension. So if, as you try to push the object against the spring, it'll push back out. As you try to pull it away, it'll pull back toward, literally giving you a springy-like result. Now, the cool thing about it is we can control the length of this spring at rest, kind of like a rubber band. So we actually, it, it's almost more appropriate to think of this like a rubber band than like an actual spring, but there's a little bit of play there. Let's take a look at setting one up, and I'll demonstrate. So let's go over into Unity, and I'm going to create a sphere. And I'll get it positioned somewhere over here near where the car is. I'm going to scale it up very slightly. Go under Component, Physics, and apply a rigid body. Then Component, Physics one more time, and we'll drop on a spring joint. Now, as soon as we do that, we get this really cool orange box visible at the very top of our sphere. This is the anchor point of our spring. Now, this can be a little bit confusing. So what I'm going to do for starters is just show you how we can adjust that. So I'm going to jump over here into my properties. The connected body property I'm going to save for last. So we're going to jump right into anchor. Now you'll notice as I change the anchor, this orange point is moving. And the documentation tries to be very clear in reminding you that this is not the point that your rigid body is going to be drawn toward. So if you're expecting to be able to take this, uh, this anchor and slide it way up here, and that would be like stretching a rubber band and it would just pull back up to that point, no, 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 that's not how this works. What you've just done is you've defined the point in space where this spring is attached to your, your object, which can be really confusing if it's really far away from your object. It's much easier to understand if you have it right here because if we actually had a real spring it would make sense to attach it to the top of our ball if you did have it outside the realm like if, if I was to take this and say here's our ball and let's say our anchor point is somewhere up here it would be as if there was an invisible rigid pin that connected my ball to that anchor point this pin would not be a spring So this distance is not a spring. What is a spring is what would happen if the motion or the forces applied to this sphere caused that anchor to move away from its original position. The spring is calculated from this anchor position. It's really all about that little orange box moving away from where it started and then springing back into position. That's really all it's about. And if you can keep that in mind, everything else goes, it goes really easy from there. So let's go back over to Unity. I'll go ahead for now, and I'll leave the anchor at the top. Now, something interesting is going to happen when we hit play. And to help illustrate this, I'm going to create another sphere. And I'll immediately take off its sphere collider. And I'm going to name this new sphere Anchor Marker. And we're going to do a couple of things to it. First off, let's get it pretty much snapped right to the middle of our existing sphere. So I'm going to hold down the V key and just snap it pretty close to the center of our first sphere. We're going to scale it down nice and tiny. And more or less, I'm just kind of trying to get it right there in the same position as our anchor object. It doesn't have to be precise, just something to help you visualize. So when I hit play, you'll understand what's happening. So I hit play. And you'll notice, as we look around, so there's our spring. You'll notice the spring is actually pulling the ball back. And the car is actually feeling that. So, I mean, once we got to the full extension of that spring, it actually stopped moving the car. But I want you to take a look at something else. And to really drive it home, I'm going to take that sphere, and I'm going to pull it away from the path of the car for just a moment. And I'll hit play. Do you see that huge distance there between where we start, where our little anchor is, and where our ball is? Now, to really show you why this is the way it is, I've got to start jumping around a little bit inside the properties. So I do ask that you bear with me. But we have a min distance 
and a max distance. Technically speaking, here's how these work. I'll, tell, I'll give you kind of a technical example for them, and then I'll give you a much more intuitive definition of how they work. So let's just start off over inside of Photoshop. Now you can think of these like so. Here is our anchor point. In fact, I should draw it as a box so that you can easily recognize it as our anchor point. Think of this as a three-dimensional spherical radius. Your min value is going to be, in this case, because it's zero, if we take a look back over inside of Unity, our min distance is currently set to zero. And if we jump back over to Photoshop, our max distance was set to 0 0.5. So this would be like having our min distance right here at the location of our anchor point and the outer radius of our sphere to 0 0.5. If any motion causes our anchor point to not move outside of this radius, then the spring joint will not be applied. The anchor point literally has to move outside of this radius and then it'll be pulled back in. Like so, that's how that works. Now, here's where it starts to get kind of fun. What happens if your min distance is greater than zero? So let's say your min distance is like 0 0.2. Well, you would end up having a a spring, your spring joint would be applied, it's like you're, if you were at like 0.1, your spring joint would be applied and then there would be kind of a chord radius, like it would be applied here within this first level, then between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 it would not be applied and then it would be applied again out here. So for most situations it makes sense to go ahead and leave your min distance set to zero, unless you're doing some really off the wall kind of stuff. For our purposes, we're just going to leave it at zero all the time. Now, that's a technical way to look at it. As long as you're leaving it at zero, there's a much easier way to think about it. This is the length of your spring when it's at rest. Right. Because if you've ever looked at a spring and bought one at the hardware store, or ripped apart a piece of equipment that had springs in it, a spring has a distance from one point to the other that it will not compress any further. Right. And that's that's the max distance. In fact, if you think about this like a rubber band, you can think of this kind of like the length of the rubber band. Right. And that's kind of an easier way to to think about it. Which is why if I do a couple of things, I got to start jumping around between properties once again. So bear with me. Go ahead and get that out of the way. There we are. So that's Windows. Thank you, Windows. Uh, let's go ahead and just hit play. And boom, you'll notice there is that gap. There's that distance that we just fell. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at our properties. Notice that our max distance is 0 0.5. That's half a unit that this thing just had to fall. If I set this to something really low, like 0 0.001, and then press play, we fall, but we're, we're fighting back because of our gravity. Where the, uh, the ball is actually being pulled back and is having to fight its own weight. Now, to help drive that home and to show you how this distance is actually working, I need to start talking about some other properties. So you've seen that we have our min and max distance. Within this distance, in between min and max, we will not be exerting our spring force. Outside of, that, outside of them, we will be. That's the big thing you got to keep in mind from a technical standpoint. Now, our spring property controls the, the strength of our spring. So let's set this to something really, really high, like 5,000. And check it out. Our ball didn't even move. Now, what I'm going to do is set our max distance back to 0.5 and hit play. And boom, we just fell down that half a unit and then stopped. Now, that's only because the strength of our spring is ridiculously high right now. It's not even working like a spring. Right. It, it's acting almost like a limit. It just drops to that distance and stops. And I'm doing that just to illustrate how this max distance is working. So if I set this to 1.5 now, we fall down to 1.5, and then we just stop. And that's because only after we fall down to that point how, do we break out of that limit for just a moment, and the spring pulls it back in, and it's going to stay right there at the minimum value. So again, you can think of it like the length of the spring at rest. Now obviously a value of 5000 is not particularly useful. 
So I'm going to set the max distance back down to 0.5, which is its default. And we'll take the spring and set it to, say, 200. So we hang there, and that's still a really strong spring. And I guess we could take this whole contraption and move it back in front of the car so we can start seeing a, uh, a result from our simulation. So now we'll hit play, and we fall. I think we're going to hit. We might need to move it down a little. And there we go. Now that's still, again, a really, really strong spring. So let's just try 20. And now we hit that length, but you can see that kind of softening bounce that's taking place. And I just knocked the camera out of the way, but that's okay, because what I want to do is move all of this down just a little bit lower so that the car could potentially get caught on it. And, oh, well, at least it slowed the car down. That's a start. So that's a look at our spring strength. Now, if your spring is moving far too quickly for some reason, or you just need to slow down its overall motion, or if it's just bouncing forever and that's a problem, then you can apply some damping to it. Now, by default, we have a damping value of 0.2. And that's important because if you leave this at zero, then potentially your spring could just keep right on bouncing until you eventually got to the sleep velocity of the object and it got switched off, which could be a while, depending on how much bounce you've just put into the system. So to counter that, you have damping, which is going to slow down the force of the spring a little bit. It's going to remove energy from it. And if we set this all the way up to a value of 1, which is 100% energy loss, we fight gravity and then we come to full rest very quickly. So it's just a matter of tweaking this until you find a value that works right to keep your object from bouncing for too long and still allows it to slow down to a rest state in a timely fashion. Now we have had to bounce around a little bit, but that gets us all the way through the anchor, through the spring, through the damper, and through the min and max distance which leaves us to brake force and brake torque. Now, as I've done in previous videos, I'll, I'll focus just on brake force as opposed to brake torque. Uh, to show brake torque, I need to apply some, uh, some force to the spin of the object, and it's just so much easier just to hit it with my car. <laughs> so that's how I'll be braking this off. So I'll move this down just a little bit, so let's see how low it actually hangs. That'll probably work. And it just so happens that over on my car object that I have a constant force waiting in the wings and we can take its relative force and we'll start off with just a, a nice 50 which I think is going to be too low to do anything really fun besides my uh, my joint is still set to infinity and if you want to have any kind of braking whatsoever this has got to be lower than infinity obviously so let's set this to one now the problem with setting it to one is that that initial fall might actually cause it to break so we got to watch out for that it didn't. The It must be the springiness of it allowed it to slow down. Now, that wasn't enough force to break it. So, uh, it looks like we're going to need more power. So, let's crank this up to, you know, think 500 again? <laughs> so, we'll hit play, and... Now, is that actually... It's not actually working, is it? I'm not seeing that response. Oh, constant force is disabled. Oh, look at that. I didn't even notice. All right, well, let's try it again. <laughs> you missed. I missed. <laughs> I pushed just a little bit too hard. Oh, well, it was still entertaining. Yes, it was. All right, so let's try 50 and hit play. And thunk. They ran right over that Ran time. right. you got to really finesse this and get it right in the right <laughs> position, don't you? All right, well, let's see if we can do that. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? We're, I'm not going to worry about that little anchor point anymore. He's already served his purpose. Let's go ahead and get him pretty much lined up right in front of the car, and then let's take the car, and let's put it right back up at 500, and let's hit play, and that broke it off, and then the car just flew away to Mars, I suppose. <laughs> and that might have been a little bit fast to pick up on video, so I think we should play it again. So yeah, it breaks off, and you can see, if you saw nothing else, you now see the ball rolling around on the ground, because the joint itself was broken. Now, there was one more thing I did want to show, so let me jump over to the car, and I guess I could just switch the constant force off again. Uh, but that was the connected body. Now, I've already shown this with other constraints, but I'll show it again here. This allows you to connect your object to another rigid body, 
as opposed to just connecting it to the world, which is what we're doing right now. We're just connecting it to a free floating point in space. So what I'm gonna do is hit Control D and duplicate this little sphere. And we'll pull both of these down. Now the bottommost sphere, I'm actually going to attach to the top and the top I'll just leave connected to the world for time being. So if I select the top one, his connected body will just be none, which means he's attached to the world. The bottom one I'll select and then I'll drag the top one into that connected body property so that now you'll see both of these guys kind of hang there and bounce. And as I pull one, you'll see it pulls the other one along as well. So that's just a way that you can constrain two springy objects together. And Lee, do you have any questions about what we've covered so far? No, that's pretty much uh, very uh, succinct. As it were. All right. Well, we'll just kind of do a real quick review. We have anchor. This is the point at which your spring is attached to your rigid body. We have the spring uh, property, which is the strength of the spring. How powerful is it? We have damping, which is going to slow it back down if your spring is pulling too quick or causing motion that seems to last forever. You have a min and max distance, which kind of defines the rest length of the spring. That's one way you can look at it. But within these values, and you'll notice they're actually really small, if your object doesn't move any further than, uh, than the distance between those two objects, then the spring will not be applied. And then finally you have brake force and brake torque, where brake force is a linear amount of force that can be applied to break and destroy this constraint. And brake torque is the same thing, but applied directly to torque. So that will wrap things up for this video. Thanks for watching.